Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Hi Israel, welcome back to the Albright. Hi Mitz. Today I want to continue our discussion of King David, who's such an important legacy figure in ancient Israel. Last time you described what you see as the earliest stratum in the David story, which depicts him as an Apiru-like figure who is, is more or less a bandit or mafioso kind of character. You dated that layer on the basis of the regular featuring of the city of Gat, which had a very limited window of significance from about 950 to 830 BC before it was destroyed. Today, let's talk about some of the other later layers in the David story. Your second layer in the David story is a very different world from the first. My second layer uh, is to be found in the court history, in the succession history, which means mainly in the second book of Samuel. What do we have there? We have this story of the unrest uh, in the kingdom of David. After King David came to power and managed to take over Jerusalem and establish his kingdom and rules over this uh, mini empire, you know, in the Levant in the 10th century BC, all of a sudden all sorts of troubles start and the troubles are mainly uprisings, revolts of uh, people close to him. And there is a long list of them. The most important and known is Absalom, of course, in the tradition, uh, if you wish, in the biblical tradition. It is very instructive to look at the details of this, uh, these uh, stories in the second uh, book of Samuel, the geography of the stories. Surprisingly, they do not deal with Judah. Surprisingly, they all deal with territories of the later to be Northern Kingdom. All the territories are in the north. So we have three of them, which I wish to mention to you very briefly. The first one is the revolt of Sheba, the son of Bichri. This revolt is related in the story to the city of town of Abel. The town of Abel is located in the northern part, on the northern border of the northern kingdom later, which means not so far from the city of Dan uh, in the Jordan Valley. Now, this place, according to archaeological information, recent archaeology, did not become part of the territory of the Northern Kingdom before the first uh, half of the 8th century BC. So this needs to be kept in the background. Then there is the story of King David crossing to Mahanaim, to Transjordan, and active there, running away to Mahanaim, to the area of the Jabok River. And this is also instructive because one of the cities mentioned there which provides help to poor King David uh, there in Transjordan is uh, Lidabir. And this Lidabir is referred to in the book of Amos as being taken over and becomes an Israelite uh, town uh, only in the days of uh, Jeroboam II, apparently in the first half of the 8th century BC. So this should be another clue, another hint of how to understand these stories. Finally, we have the story of Absalom. Absalom is related to the kingdom, to the Aramean uh, kingdom of Geshur. Geshur is to be located, according to the biblical tradition, some, somewhere in the, how to say, southern Golan Heights, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Possibly the capital of Geshur is uh, in the site of Etel, known to the public as Bethsaida, on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee, exactly where the Jordan River comes into the Sea of Galilee. Now, the kingdom of Geshur prospered apparently in the 9th century, and there is good reason to suppose that it was taken over by Hazael when he established his mini, em his mini empire ruled by Damascus in the second half of the 9th century. So there too we are either before the takeover of Geshur, if you wish, as a marginal Aramean uh, territory, uh, in the 9th century, middle of the 9th century perhaps, and the takeover of uh, Geshur by Hazael in the second half of the 9th century. So the, again, we have here some sort of a stage setting. The stage setting of the court history 
also the idea of, uh, you know, a complex court events with the uh, administration, with the elaborate, sophisticated administration, all this fits one way or the other what we know about the Northern Kingdom of Israel in a way in the 9th century under the Omrides and then again in the beginning of the 8th century under uh, uh, King Jeroboam II who was in my opinion at least the most powerful of all Hebrew monarchs Israel and Judah combined. So this is uh, what we can say about the court history that we have a background which is earlier than the final composition of the 7th century but later than the these early memories of uh, David as a leader of an Apiru uh, band on the margin of Jerusalem. The details of David's warfare and war activities also tie into this. Oh yes, the wars. Uh, the second book of Kings also provide us, provides us with uh, quite a lot of information about the wars of King David, the expansion of his uh, kingdom, of his empire. Uh, if you wish, and there are details of wars with the, Aram with the Arameans, with Damascus, and with the, uh, I mean, with the Arameans that can be translated to Damascus, let's put it this way, uh, with Moab, with Ammon, and so on. And here too, I think that uh, we need to take a look at the details. For instance, the wars of the King David are characterized by big uh, forces of chariots. In the context of the 10th century BC in Judah, I mean, poor Jerusalem of the time, the southern highlands of uh, Jerusalem, perhaps with the 2,000 people living there all together with old people and, and children. So we are not in a context of big armies of chariots and things like this. Of course, this comes from the reality of later times. And chariot warfare is typical of the 9th century, of the confrontations with Assyria and then the confrontations also I think of Aram and Israel in the 9th and 8th uh, centuries BC. So, so this too should be seen on the background of this phase, I would say 9th beginning of the 8th century uh, BC. Also uh, remarks in the Bible on other territories which were taken over by King David. Let me give you one example. The rule of King David over Edom. First thing to say is that there was no Edom in the 10th century BC as a territorial entity. We have no information whatsoever, archaeological or ancient Near Eastern, for Edom becoming a player on the map of the Levant as a territory, as a territorial entity before 800 BC or so. The first reference is from the time of Adad Nirari, uh, king of Assyria. Second, there is no power again in Judah to rule over big territory and farther away in the desert in the 10th century BC. However, there is reason to argue that in the context of the first half of the 8th century, when the northern kingdom of Israel was at its peak of its power, both economic and political and military, and it dominated the kingdom of Judah, it could have also acted then uh, along the trade routes in the south. We have this evidence for uh, the site uh, in the northeastern uh, part of uh, the Sinai, which is related to uh, the northern kingdom. We'll speak about it later, and also in Edom, I think. So the story about King David ruling over Edom may depict a real situation in the first half of the 8th century of Judah uh, representing the interest of the Northern Kingdom, if you wish, in the time of Jeroboam II, dominating the trade route along the Edomite Plateau in the south. How about the relationship between David and Saul as it's depicted in the books of Samuel? Uh, modern scholars have understood that there's some sort of apology here on behalf of the writers for uh, David and Saul. Right, so this would be the, my third layer. My third layer is, ex layer is exactly about this. Reading the book of Samuel, the first book of Samuel, the rise of David to power, you always hear two voices. 
there is one voice which is positive to King Saul and negative to King David. Please note that wherever King David goes in the first book of Samuel, somebody drops dead uh, one way or the other. So there is this negative tradition. The question, of course, where does it come from? And then there is a second voice always saying to you something like, I would say in words of today, no, 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 you misunderstood the whole thing. Let me explain to you what uh, we really mean to say. Mm -hmm. So how to harmonize the two voices? In my opinion, they cannot be harmonized. I mean, or not mm, in a simplistic way. So indeed, scholars suggested a very good, there was a, this very good proposal by uh, uh, your teacher Baruch Halperin and Kyle McCarter before him, I think that we are dealing here with, the, with an apology, which means there are these accusations, and then there is the apology of King David explaining what really happened. Let me tell you what really happened. But this is not a good answer, or it's a good answer, but only partially good answer. Why? Because then we need to ask, when? So Rost would tell you in the 10th century BC, Halperin I think also, mm. in the 10th century BC. But in the 10th, 10th century BC, you take your scissors and you take it out, that's it. You can censor a voice like this. So the question should be asked in the following way, in a different way. What is the time when the negative traditions on the founders of the Davidic dynasty could not be censored? And my answer would be, after 720 BC, when Judah went through a dramatic transformation all of a sudden, transf transformation that we see in archaeology, in the growth of dramatic growth in Jerusalem, in the dramatic uh, expansion of settlement activity in the Shephelah and in the highlands of Judah. As a result, the only way to explain it is to argue that people from Israel came to Judah after the takeover of Israel by the Assyrians in 720 BC. So some people will tell me, why should people run away from the villages? My answer would be, not from the villages. The people who were in danger of deportation in the Northern Kingdom were the literati, the intelligentsia, the administration, and they were the ones who had to run away in order to avoid deportation to Mesopotamia. So they came to Judah, and this is the moment that Judah came, com, comes to power. And Judah, in fact, goes through a dramatic transformation. It's not anymore the Judah that we knew before, you know, the small kingdom on the margin of the great powers, if you wish, uh, even the local powers of the southern uh, Levant, always dominated by one of, the, by one of them with the a small capital and countryside uh, sparsely settled, all of a sudden Judah becomes a meaningful, significant kingdom after 720 and the population is not anymore Judahite. It's a mix of Judahite and Israelites. And these Israelites, those Israelites, they come, let's say, from the area of Bethel, which is not far to the north uh, of Judah, from the area perhaps also of Shechem and Samaria. And they come from their own traditions. Those who came from Bethel, for instance, could have arrived with the traditions of the first king of Israel, Saul, who ruled from a hub not so far from Bethel in the same territory. And these traditions were hostile to the Davidic dynasty and to the founders. They, what did they say? They say, well, look at this David. He, was, he cooperated with the enemies of Israel. He went to the Philistines. He went to this. He went to that. He was some sort of a traitor. And then you, so, so y the authors in Jerusalem were in a situation that they could not simply throw out the negative stories about King David. In parenthesis, I would tell you that the much later author of the book of Chronicles did exactly that. He censored everything negative on David. But the early authors, could not censor the traditions of the Israelites because they were a significant part of the population of uh, Judah after 720 BC. So they incorporated them, they respected the traditions of the north, but they had to answer them. So this is the moment that you have to come up with your apologia 
ap apology and explain what really happened and turn it in order to, you know, protect the memory of the founder of the dynasty in Jerusalem. So, so in my opinion, the third layer is from the late 8th century, beginning of the 7th century. There is no reason, there is no logic in saying, well, the third layer is from the time of uh, Josiah, because what? So then they would live peacefully with negative uh, uh, voices about the founder of the dynasty for one century? No, I don't think so. So short time after the, this transformation of Judah, they had to answer the negative traditions of the north. And I would put this in the very late 8th century or beginning of the 7th century, when it is already possible to think about composition of biblical texts in Judah from the point of view of the evidence of archaeology. Your first three layers demonstrate a long development of the Davidic tradition from the 10th century all the way to the 8th century. When do we get to see the final product? The final product is in the time of the Deuteronomistic activity, the Deuteronomistic historian, which means the historian, historians, who sit and put together a history of ancient Israel from related to the book of Deuteronomy, and thereby they are called the Deuteronomists. And they give the story of the uh, history of ancient Israel from the book of Joshua to the second uh, book of Kings. And they are active, at least the first layer, the early layer, they are active in the time of King Josiah of Judah in the late 7th century BC. There, is, there are later layers, of course, but the first layer, in my opinion at least, is in the 7th century. So what do we have in this layer in the story? We have things that we have already described when we spoke about, for instance, the uh, Philistines uh, in the Bible. Most of the traditions regarding David and the Philistines uh, come from this layer of the Deuteronomistic activity in the time of Josiah, which means the battle between David and Goliath, with Goliath dressed as a Greek hoplite, or the armor uh, is the armor of a Greek hoplite of the 7th, 6th centuries BC, the genre, the Homeric genre of a duel that decides the fate of the two armies, the story of the Seranim, the lords of the Philistines, the Keratites and the Pelatites as the commander units, the elite units uh, of uh, King David, the League of Cities, these things we these items we described already when we spoke about the Philistines in the Bible. This vision of the United Monarchy, we've already seen, doesn't fit the reality on the ground. Uh, how do we connect that to, to the, what's going on in the late 7th century? Exactly. So there is another uh, aspect of the layer of the 7th century. Not only the Philistines described on the background of the history of the 7th century BC and the culture of the 7th century, also the broader ideology, in fact, that we have in the story. This, what is the description of this great united monarchy, prosperous united monarchy, glamorous united monarchy, the rule from this wonderful city of Jerusalem with palace and temple uh, of uh, the early Davidites, the founders of the Davidic uh, dynasty, and the great empire territorially? What, what is the idea here? And since we know by now, as you mentioned, that this cannot be read in a simplistic way on the background of what we know archaeologically and from the ancient Near Eastern text about the 10th century BC, so then the question is even more difficult. How to read this? If, so th there is no real example uh, you know, of this united monarchy unless we look at the Northern Kingdom uh, in the 9th and 8th centuries BC. But there is more to that. In fact, the description of a united monarchy, even if leaning on the memories from the Northern Kingdom, uh, this description speaks in a way about the future. This is after the Northern Kingdom is no more. The territories is out there to grab because the Assyrians already pulled out from the Levant. And in the time of King Josiah, in the late 7th century BC, a window of opportunities uh, supposedly, ostensibly, is open to fulfill this idea of a great united uh, monarchy which rules over all the territories of the Hebrews, north and south combined, and ruled from Jerusalem 
Vaya David died, and we are speaking now about King Josiah, who is described in the Bible as the most righteous of the Davidic uh, kings and uh, compared to King David. So these two, the wrapping of the whole story, should be understood on the background of the fourth layer, the final layer, mm. final early layer, <laughs> let's put it this way, in the 7th century BC. The story of David is richly layered, as you've suggested today. Let's wrap it up in a nice little package. One of the most complex stories in the Hebrew Bible, the story of King David. The historical David was a modest figure, the founder of a dynasty in the traditional hub of the Southern Highlands, ruling over a limited territory. Uh, he becomes uh, big as the centuries uh, go by. He becomes big and important, especially because of the ideology, territorial ideology and theology of the Kingdom of Judah, centuries after his own time, in late monarchic times. He becomes uh, great because of the many layers. He becomes important also because of this wonderful description of this character for, that has many aspects of a great king at the same time, a, a person who is not, you know, perfect. So it, he becomes important and big because of the ideology of Judah, because of course of the theology of early Christianity as well. And he becomes even bigger because of all this. When he is a symbol of monarchy in uh, the gr for all the great European dynasties in uh, medieval times, late antiquity and medieval times, from uh, Charlemagne to the kings uh, the, of the Franks um, to the Ottonians uh, in Germany to the uh, throne of David of the British kings. Okay, thank you Israel. Next time let's take up Solomon. Sure.